All right, well, Reza, let's just uh, take off and let's see, we're recording right now. And is that right? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Reza. No worries. My pleasure. All right, so. Let me get my slides. All right. So let's start. Um, today I'm going to talk about multi-architectural Kubernetes clusters. Um, my name is Reza. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera. Um, Tigera is the company behind uh, open source project Calico. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I, like, uh, I like to take long hours. Uh, to bang my head against the table and figure things out. Uh, I'm always eager to learn new stuff and open to suggestions. So let's connect and exchange ideas. Um, this talk is divided into seven sections. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Project Calico and give you a bit of an overview of what it is that we do. Um, then I'm going to explain uh, what I mean by a multi-architectural cluster. I will show you a multi-architectural cluster demo in EKS. And if you're not still convinced, I will uh, share some Nginx benchmarks and numbers uh, in both x86 and ARM64 uh, environment using standard Linux data plane. Then I'm going to install Calico and switch to eBPF data plane and do the benchmarking part again. So hopefully everything works, but you know, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, if you got any questions, uh, please type them in the chat. I'll try my best to answer it at the end of each section or um, at the end of presentation. If I don't know the answer to your question, uh, which by my experience is going to be a lot of them, uh, please remind me in Project Calico Slack and I'll try to connect you with people who know way more than me that can help you with whatever it is that you want to know. All right, so um, I have an overview. Uh, what is Project Calico? Um, Project Calico is a community, ba uh, community behind a peer layer three approach to virtual networking for highly scalable uh, data centers. Uh, by layer three, I mean IP and routing. Uh, Calico is an open source networking and network security solution for containers, virtual machines, um, native cloud, uh, cloud host based and uh, host-based network uh, workloads. It is important to note that um, Calico is not just a Kubernetes CNI. In fact, Calico supports a broad range of platforms, including OpenShift, Mirantis, OpenStack, and bare metal services. Uh, over at Calico, we got an active community. So if you would like to join us, these are some of the uh, social handles that you can find us. All right, so what is a multi-architectural cluster? Before we can talk about that, um, let's talk about what are the benefits and why we should care. Um, in every project, there are a variety of workloads. Um, these workloads can run more efficiently using different processors, uh, which might result in cost saving and performance boost. Uh, as an example, um, in memory databases uh, like uh, Memcached or Redis, um, will achieve better performance and, and you have to pay actually less money if you're using ARM architecture rather than x86. Um, now that we know the benefits, and hopefully saving money is intriguing to us. Uh, let's talk about what I mean by multi-architectural cluster. Uh, when participating nodes 
in a cluster have different CPU architectures, we have a multi-architectural cluster. Usually, uh, when we create a Kubernetes cluster, we use an Intel or AMD CPU, which is based on x86 or AMD64. Um, I'm going to draw a circle. And, and on the first picture, as you can see, uh, both these nodes that are participating in this cluster are based on AMD64 architecture. Uh, by the way, AMD64 refers to the 64-bit processor. It doesn't mean uh, these processors are actually AMD. It could be Intel or AMD. Um, in a multi-architectural cluster, we use uh, nodes that have different processors, allowing us to divide workloads based on their processing needs. Uh, if you look at the second picture, where I'm going to draw a circle, um, an ARM64 node is participating in this cluster. All right. So what is ARM? Um, ARM is a family of processors uh, running on the RISC architecture. Uh, reduce instruction set computer or RISC is referred to processors that use a few amount of highly optimized instructions to do a task very quickly. Um, fun fact, uh, ARM Limited is also a chip company that doesn't, produce, doesn't mass produce uh, chips. Uh, their business model is to provide licenses to other companies, allowing them to use their design to uh, create their own uh, custom build processors by their patented technology, by ARM patented technology. All right, so what is the difference between ARM and x86? Um, the main difference between these two can be traced back to the way that these CPUs execute instructions. Um, as an example, um, an x86 desktop CPU uses an implementation of complex instruction set computer or CISC, allowing it to use a single instruction to execute a multi-step operation in a clock cycle. Um, in this slide, we have a C source code in the left side, hopefully for you too, uh, and the assembly representation of it in both x86 and ARM64 instructions. In this source code, I want to create two variables called A and B, um, assign a value to each, then multiply them and store the results in uh, the variable A. Now, um, this procedure, uh, when it's done in ARM, uses LDR and SDR, which are here, uh, to directly load the values into its registers. And when it is finished, the value remains in the register makes it possible to be used again by the next instruction if it's needed. In x86, however, this process, when it's done, uh, it gets automatically reloaded. And the portion of data that was calculated will be moved to RAM. And if it's needed again, it needs to go to the stack and load it from RAM. This is shown here by the move EA, uh, zero to EAX. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert in these two CPU architectures in any way, but if you're interested to know more, there's a link at the end of this presentation that, you might, that might assist you in your computer architecture journey. All right, the hard part is over. Uh, who uses ARM? Uh, wherever power efficiency is needed, ARM shines. Uh, smartphones are a great example of this. Most smartphones and tablets are using customized CPUs that are based on ARM design. Many laptops 
and laptop manufacturers are also migrating to R um, because of its power efficiency. Um, Apple newest uh, family of chips, M1 something, is arguably one of the most known example of that. Uh, another area that ARM processors are used is the supercomputers, uh, Fugaku. Uh, yes, I think I pronounced it uh, correctly, Fugaku. The world fastest supercomputer at the moment is powered by ARM processors. While all these areas are interesting on their own, uh, I'm only going to talk about ARM-based processors in the cloud. All right, so what about the cloud? Um, Amazon launched their custom design processors called Graviton back in 2018, allowing users to choose ARM64 architecture in cloud using A1 general purpose EC2 instances. Um, in 2019, Amazon introduced Graviton 2, uh, an upgrade to their last gen CPUs. Uh, providing a variety of instances, which are called um, M6 family, if, yeah, uh, M M6 family, with better price to performance ratio. ratio. Uh, all right. So, how the cost saving works? Um, this is an estimate generated by AWS estimation tool. As you can see, an M6 large arm instance at the top of this picture using the same resources is 20 percent cheaper than an m5 large x86 instance in the bottom all right is there any question that i know the answer to <laughs> nope all right great um Let's go to the demo part then. All right. Um, I had to prepare an x86 cluster in advance um, since creating the initial control plane and adding two AMD64 node takes around 20 minutes. And it's uh, much more boring than listening to me. Uh, but I'm going to show you how to add an ARM64 node to the cluster and talk about some of the problems that you might encounter along the way. Um, if you're new to EKS, don't worry, I got you covered. There is a link at the end of uh, this presentation that will guide you on how to create everything that I do here from scratch. Um, by the way, uh, in this demo, I'm going to use uh, two M5 large and one M6G large instance, which I introduced in the previous cost saving slide, if you remember. All right. So hopefully I got a cluster. And yep, there are some notes in it. Yes, my cluster got two AMD64 nodes. Now I'm using EKS cattle to manage this cluster. And if I want to add uh, an ARM node group, I will get an error talking about, all right, you want to do something, but you have to update your uh, add-ons and stuff. So this happens because um, some of the manifests in EKS Cattle uh, only have the <coughs> only have the affinity that applies to uh, AMD sixty four. In order to correct this, we need to um, use EKS Cattle updates command to um, one by one update these components. These components are CordianS, AWS Node, and um, the other one is Coop Proxy. So CordianS is 
all the DNS stuff that happens inside the cluster. AWS node is the default CNI that you use uh, when you are creating an EKS cluster, it will it will get installed by default and you can remove it later, but let's say it's the default thing that happens every time. And Coop Proxy is the pod that will manage all the uh, communication between your cluster and the outside world. And if we check one of these um, resources after our update, we can see in the affinity, in the node affinity, there is an ARM64 uh, value that allows everything to be same for both architectures. Now, you sometimes you might get another error, which will be EKS cattle complaining about coup proxy. I found it to be safer if we remove the uh, coup proxy daemon set and use an EKS cattle force update to refresh the add on. It just, it's something that happens from time to time. Now, now that we have done everything, we can create our ARM64. Uh, we can add our ARM64 node group to the cluster. Um, this is gonna take uh, around six minutes. So, Let's go back to the presentation part. All right. So we were hopefully here. All right. So while the ARM node is going to be prepared, um, let's talk about uh, the performance boot and uh, performance boost and some of the benchmarks. Now, for the performance boost part, I'm going to talk about Nginx. Um, as described on Nginx website, Nginx is an uh, is a proxying and uh, is an open source software for web serving, um, reverse proxying, caching, load balancing, uh, media streaming, and much more. If it's in the web, there's a way for Nginx to do it. Um, Nginx is quite popular these days. As a matter of fact, um, Netcraft, a website that analyzes many aspects of internet, uh, including the market share of web servers, shows Nginx as the leader of market share between all sites among uh, web server developers. Um, you should be able to see the uh, Cedar graph, which I took from Netcraft website. And this is the benchmark part. All right. So for the benchmark, um, this chart shows how many requests uh, a benchmarking application called WRK was able to do per second in a three minute time window to grab a 10 kilo kilobit, yeah, 10 kilobit uh, file from Nginx using two threads and 50 concurrent connections. Um, this should uh, probably simulate a real life scenario, like uh, grabbing a CSS a file from your web server. So in this chart, um, with around 9 million requests per seconds, an ARM64 environment was, uh, sorry, uh, an ARM64 environment has a significant uh, advantage against x86 with like 9 million uh, requests per second, while x86 was uh, doing around 6 million uh, requests per second 
in the same uh, amount of time with the same parameters and everything. All right. So Calico EBPF. Um, Calico EBPF part. Uh, first of all, we need to talk about what is EBPF. Uh, but let me check out. Nope, still no questions. Great. All right, so what is eBPF? Um, the original BPF or Berkeley packet filter was designed to capture and filtering network packets that match specific rules. Uh, BPF allows programmers to interact with the Linux kernel in a secure way and taking advantage of the Linux kernel capability <laughs> in a fail-safe fail environment. Um, how does eBPF relate to Calico? Um, Calico has a pluggable data plane approach to container networking. This means on top of all its security features, Calico provides multiple ways to transfer your data inside a cluster, allowing more flexibility and better performance tuning where it is required. Um, I have chosen eBPF since it can preserve the source IP of the client, which was a big problem for me whenever I used to host a web server inside a Kubernetes cluster. All right, so let's go back to the demo and hopefully, yep. So in the demo, now that we have, uh, Cooper, now that we have added our ARM64 node group, we should be able to see the node with ARM64 indicator. And I'm going to... Reza? Yes? Quick question. So I'm just noticing here, I mean, is it, is it typical that you'd have nodes with different versions of Kubernetes? So, no. Um, in this, um, in this uh, example, because um, I'm using Bottle Rocket, and Bottle Rocket, uh, I think they pushed this uh, version 121.4 for ARM64 like two days ago, and their uh, 21.5 is still not ready. Okay. That's why we're watching this. But it should always, it usually is always like, um, uh, what is it, equal to each other. I just wonder if one lags behind the other as far yes. as when they. It, it, I, as I said, it is usually equal, but in this instance, because uh, their, uh, their bottle rocket is, uh, bottle rocket ARM64 support is still an ongoing thing. There still lag like one release here. I noticed that as well. All right, so I'm going to label my nodes. And this is because I want to be able to uh, use my Demo app. All right. So I've got a demo application that is using um, some um, node selector uh, criteria to run itself on ARM sixty four and uh, AMD 64 respectively. And the labeling part is just 
uh, for this demo application to get uh, load balanced around the nodes uh, fairly. And after we have done this, we can run the benchmarking part, which is the WRK that I talked about. And this <coughs> will take around three minutes. We'll come back to this. Uh, let's get to the eBPF part. Um, eBPF part, uh, I'm using Tiger Operator. So basically, you just install the Tiger Operator, which is a link that you can consume with Coop Cattle Apply. Um, and then you need to apply the installation resource. So this is a, a configuration that operator will load and find out uh, and finds out how to install the uh, Calico and what are the parameters that might be applicable to your environment. After that, um, since in eBPF mode, uh, we don't need the coup proxy pods because Calico will take over all the responsibilities. We can uh, get rid of the um, we can get rid of the coop proxy daemon set. Um, but before um, getting rid of the coop proxy daemon set, we need to um, make Calico, uh, we need to direct Calico on how to talk to the uh, Kubernetes API server. All right, so in order to do that, uh, we can check out the coop system coop proxy. Um, and if we check out here, our server is actually is using an FQDN to talk to the coop, Kubernetes API server. Um, we're going to need this address in order to create a customized, sorry, in order to create a config map that will allow a like our operator um, to show how Calico can uh, talk to the Kubernetes API server directly. After creating this resource, uh, we should be able to get rid of the Kube proxy pods. Um, you resident? Yes. So with a three node cluster, not a lot on there, these type of operations, okay. But in a large cluster, hundreds of nodes, whatever, large, you know, getting rid of Kube proxy and reinstalling all this, what, what's your, what's, the, what's the migration path to a seamless environment? All right, so I don't think you can change your data plane like uh, without, uh, I don't think there's a seamless uh, integration for changing your data plane since you are changing the way that data is actually is using to get from point A to point B. But I can uh, connect you with people who know more than me that might know a way for it to do, for, for it to do it. But off the top of my head, I think there will be a like three to five seconds delay if you're changing like at least all the uh, all the connections that you have open need to get reset it in order to use the ebpf data plane it's also also a reason to not run one cluster right so if true. you add eight yeah. clusters you yeah. could route everything to one do true. the maintenance and true 
Yeah. Or just YOLO that thing. Yeah. Do it. Most places, <laughs> most places would take what is likely less than a minute of downtime, having like vetted it on a test or integration cluster. Sure. If you didn't want to, but even better, just stop treating your clusters like pets. Yeah, no, I agree. You yeah. Can do yeah. But I mean, yeah, you, you do have that cost as well, because at, at some point you're going to have well, that's where so like at Reddit, it was two clusters and one of the big, biggest benefits was so um, not only can you like restrict stuff into AZs, but if you do zonal clusters yeah. and you have three of them, you now have a great boundary to be like, well, we'll try this on one of them true. and you can do it while shifting loads yeah. away and back. And it's it's a better model than just assuming the cluster can be your yeah. save all of everything, because there's a lot of operations like this and plenty on GKE as well where you're either you can't do it on an existing cluster or you can't do it without some amount of downtime. And when we had we did some larger multi-cluster because Yeah, I think this is like the safest way to do it. Thank you. All right. So if we check our pods, there is a group proxy here and if we patch the coop proxy manifest, it should, yep, it is terminating and we don't have a coop proxy. All right. Now, after doing this, we need to tell Calico that we want to use eBPF, which is fairly easy. Um, we just direct Tiger operator to tell the Calico, all right, the Linux data plane that I want to use is BBPF. And after that, it will take around um, 60 seconds tops for all the Calico nodes to turn on eBPF. That, I would assume that is also like a disruptive change. Existing flows terminate and have to be reestablished under the new Yes. Cap. So the best path that I have found to do this is to have the coup proxy on and turn on eBPF. Then when you see the logs, get rid of the coup proxy. So, yeah. This was like the minimum disruption that I could like inflict to my cluster is is that so it looks like this is being set on the daemon set is it something you could have a mixed mode where like certain node pools were using ebpf others were using the previous or no and okay. um, i i don't think that will be possible well, but it's, i mean it's it's handling it at a different layer right like why it, as long as i guess you would have to have two different daemon sets but like, there's no reason that a version of one data plane couldn't talk to the other because it's not sharing stuff across nodes, or it is. If you're both, if they're both using Calico IPAM, then you're okay. You can oh, do that. They, they might conflict on IPs, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. If they're if they're using the same IP, like theoretically, this theoretically probably. This is this is actually a great question. So, I would also like to know the answer to it. <laughs> so let me know. I can ask um, one of our developers why this is not possible. I, I would expect that it is something like IP addresses aren't accounted for across both and you'd have to have like a really special config map that says here's the IP addresses for the, the original data plane, here's the ones for the eBPF because once it hits that layer, like it's, it's kind of just, I guess maybe it doesn't hand off information, like what's, what's actually doing the routing and is that different between the two? So the routing is taking place by Felix and Felix is telling uh, Felix is a part of Calico that is uh, dictating what uh, every packet should do. Um, I guess you're, you're right. I think once you leave the node in English, like each node is in isolation. Doesn't but it, it may be that it doesn't have a global view. So you could only talk okay. to pods that were on the same data plane as you yeah, yeah. implement I, I need to get help to answer this it's out of my knowledge sorry so it's, 
We're also, it's not yeah. using BGP, right? So like if it was a yeah, BGP instead of playing, it shouldn't matter because it's sharing it by BGP. But mm -hmm. I don't think that Calico does that. So. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, all right. So where was I? Um, all right. So after, uh, all right. So these are the same benchmarks that I have created uh, using the same application with the same parameters, uh, but with Calico eBPF on ARM and x86. So everything is the same. The only thing that is different is the uh, uh, Linux data points. All right, so these are the resources that you can use to do it yourself. Uh, the GitHub page is actually up at the moment. Uh, the bottom, uh, the other GitHub presentation link is another benchmark that I have done for in database memories, Redis. I think it was Redis. There's a performance boost there. Uh, if something doesn't work, please let me know. I can be found on these locations. Um, this is credits, all the things that I have used that uh, other people created to present to you uh, my findings. As promised, you can find the entrance to the arm rabbit hole at the bottom of this page. And uh, I almost forgot. Uh, the most important part, I have to thank you for giving me the opportunity to bore you with the things that are interesting to me. So. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any questions? So I guess the, you had separate deployments, I believe. There is a way of providing multi-architecture images, correct? Okay. So like you can have a single deployment about that. across. I know there is in like the OCI spec. And because like if you do Docker poll, right. you're not saying what your art is. Right. So it's providing it as part of the protocol. So I think there is yeah. like multi-arc manifest. I just don't know if Kubernetes. All right. So that part, I actually know the answer to. Hey. <laughs> When you uh, when you use a manifest to create a pod, um, that pods need to pull an image, right? Your container environment, runtime environment, look at the architecture that you have and look at the uh, address that you want, the repository address that you want to uh, pull the image from and checks if there is a, mm -hmm. There is a, there's the same architecture image available on that uh, on that repository. If it's not, it will um, let's say you have an image that only have an AMD sixty four. It will pull that AMD sixty four, and you will get an error that exists C format whatever it is that it will show you when you are trying to run a binary that is compiled for another architecture. So it should be possible that if you had a deployment for Nginx, even though it would be targeting like either a generic set of node pools or just no target whatsoever, it could be launched on either because it's gonna be the kubelet or whatever's pulling the image is the thing that says, I need the ARM version or I need the, the x86 version. It, yeah. is there is there anything or any reason why you wouldn't want a service that then targets that set of pods that could be mixed? Because I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't just work there either. I think it makes right? performance. Like right? as long as the workloads actually are identical, like you, it, it's probably gonna make your metrics look weird, not using two separate deployments and two separate services, but there's no reason you couldn't just forward your web requests to those. The favorite I, people I actually- One service that goes to two deployments as well. There's actually, um, for the benchmarking part, right? Yeah. I had two services, so I'm actually doing what you are proposing. But, there but there's, no, there's no reason you couldn't get rid of the two and just have one letting so, 
letting it, either one pull it or either yeah. one rest it. The, I think the only thing that uh, led to this way of uh, like creating, like this way of ma creating the manifest was that I wanted to do a benchmark. And if it's trying to uh, contact the server, there's a round robin there, right? It tries to load balance. And one of the connections might get to the ARM, uh, uh, ARM pod. The other one might go to the x86. So the results that I have might be inconsistent, right? Yeah, and so definitely like the heat same performance, you probably would want them separate. But like if this was a batch workload and you just want to farm it out to whatever available preemptible is there, there's no reason that a service targeting multiple would work. Yeah, yeah it should work. Uh, as long as like, let's say you have um, an environment that got both ARM and x86 and you have deployed nginx as a reverse proxy so if you create a server that aims uh, that targets uh these uh that targets um something like an application server whenever mm -hmm. the server tries to talk to the arm 64 you will get the same result then uh, and whenever x86 tries to talk to the target, you will get the same results as well. Because it, it doesn't matter, right? It just, the, the Nginx is just a reverse proxy in that scenario. I, I know at Rancher, we see a lot of, uh, where you're mixing AMD and, and ARM nodes in a cluster for things like Daemon sets. So mm -hmm. if you have Fluent Bit, you don't want to mm -hmm. manage two different Daemon sets, you just want to deploy it, and then it just takes care of figuring out the architecture. I, I know one of the things that we run into a lot is especially when you first start, a lot of deployments, especially community deployments, don't have node selectors set up on them. Oh, yeah. So, you know, suddenly an AMD image starts being deployed on an ARM node and just everything goes crazy. So you end up having to manually go in and fix a lot of that. That is true. Because before starting to like learn about ARM64 and x86, even I didn't know about the node selectors. It was like some, it's something, it's, it's there, but nobody uses it. That's true. But Not everybody have, uses it. I did have a question on the EKS. Um, so besides like EKS and using Amazon's uh, ARM nodes, do you see a lot of other solutions out there for like customers that don't want to go to the cloud or want to, you know, I, right. I, I see Raspberry Pis all the time, but it's like, yes. come on, I need some, with some horsepower. Yeah, so um, I think, like, I think um, if you have Raspberry Pis, um, not Raspberry Pis, like, you can deploy it with Raspberry Pis, but if you want to go, like, uh, if you want to do bigger stuff, I think you'll be able to do it with, like, these new uh, Mac chips, M1 and M, what is it? M Max, whatever, that came like yesterday or whatever. So you could use those and create like multi-architectural cluster in on-premise and do everything um, as I uh, described. The only difference would be the EKS cattle part. You just need to create images and um that's it you just need to create the images okay and as a matter of fact i think there is blog post that will be published in the coming week that i actually show you how you can run this um in an on-premise setup using k3s yeah um, so, so I'm with Rancher, by the way. Uh, uh, that's what we have to do for our builds is, is we have to rent VMs through AWS, and they can get expensive when you start getting into the bigger VMs. So we've just been looking at it's like, you know, Pies are great, but you know, Pies at a data center, it's not, they they only make such a big enough pie. 
Uh, have you guys played with like emulating ARM to get around that? Yes, there's a cost to it. So you can actually use, uh, what was it? Uh, bin FMT MISC, um, the Linux uh, interpreter uh -huh. that you can um, say for which binary use which interpreter and use uh, QEMO uh -huh. to uh, attach to your containers and all your um, everything inside your container will be uh, um, emulating and uh, in an, another architecture environment. However, there is a huge uh, performance uh, issue there because you have to like um, the computer needs to interpret everything from ARM64 to x86 and then interpret this again to ARM64 so the, mm. node, uh, the container knows what is happening. It is possible. You can do it with multi-arc um, project. It's, uh, in, uh, it's in Docker. If you check the Docker hub, they have um and github they have one like um uh, it's multi-arc github.com slash multi-arc they have a solution for this that uses bin fmt underline misc header but cool. as i said there's going to be a performance issue <laughs> yeah so, i mean we're not really concerned about performance it's more arm nodes are kind of a pain and it's like, okay, I'm just doing a Docker build so I can publish this image. I'm okay with you know, mm -hmm. waste, wasting some cores for a period of time. If, uh, if it's like a Go program that has cross-platform building, I think you can use something like Canico, so like a daemonless container building pipeline. Mm -hmm. Some of those also have cross-platform. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't help if, you're, if you don't have access to those tool chains. But like, if the problem is you can't run Docker multi platform don't run docker right like just build the binary file system that you need and the root fs and and you can do a lot of that composition without ever having to run anything if you can spit out the right bits right you actually don't need docker uh, as i said you just need to register um bin fmt uh for your linux um, i think it was it is in system uh, let me just uh, show you what I mean by this. So bin FMT miss. I think it was around kernel three something that they introduced it. The are, you, uh, are you on the terminal? Because we can't see that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm trying to find the page. All right. So this is actually what I'm talking about. Hmm. Hopefully this is now readable. Yep. So that that's still QEMU emulation, right? Yes. yes. So like something like Doc, if you're if you're using Go, mm -hmm. you can just compile straight to whatever architecture you want. It doesn't. There's just flags. It's it's one of the nice yeah. things. About Go. And True. once you have that, then you just have to get the rest of the image built. And so if the problem was, oh well, I can't do that with with Docker daemon then canico doesn't require running a daemon and has multi-arc support as well so it, it kind of helps eliminate some of those problems if you are in a language that supports spitting out the raw assembly that you need true but i think the only problem that i was like facing it was when i created the binary with go I needed to check it out to see if it's running actually properly or if it's working. Yeah, but you so can at least do the whole like image preparation mm -hmm. on yeah. whatever your normal build pipeline is and then feed it through some True. testing system. Yeah. That yeah, is that's cool. I didn't I didn't know you could just uh you know wire up emulation right onto whatever binary you want to run. That's cool. Yeah. It's it is cool actually. It was something that when I found out was like, oh, Great. So Reza, you uh, on your benchmark is mainly network uh, throughput. What is, what's, what's the like CPU benchmarks? I mean, is it as greater? I mean, uh, what is it? What, about 30% on, on this benchmark? So 
It depends. Um, I have not uh, conducted a CPU benchmark for Nginx, but uh, for Redis, uh, it's around 20% CPU. Um, yeah, it's, it's a 20% CPU uh, usage, uh, which if you are using ARM64, you get like 20% uh, more uh, CPU uh, to play with. So the, it, it really just depends on your yeah. workflow. So yeah. the, yes. the, uh, the Tau VMs that Google's launching, they're claiming also 20% improvement over even the, the gravity <laughs> yeah. without having to jump into the ARM space. So they, it, and it all's whatever benchmark you want. You could get it sure. to say, it's all match yeah. It's like, so if you're doing really heavy instructions like SIMD style stuff, like ARM might be able to keep up. If you're just shuffling bytes around, it can definitely run laps around you because it's, it's designed to do stuff. So like that, the web server is the exact thing of like handling a whole bunch of sockets and threads. Arm is going to do great at uh, heavy lifting code with heavy algorithms. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I think the like wherever you want to do something, as uh, it was mentioned, like it's a complex thing. You can use Arm. However, in most scenarios, you have to optimize your code to get the performance boost. Um, in memory databases, um, web servers and video encodings are, I think, only maybe some of the few uh, some, uh, few parts that you can actually run uh, run and get the performance boost without doing anything, just like compiling it for ARM sixty four. These are three things that I know of. There might be many more, but these three, I know that um, uh, ARM64 is way better than x86 without any performance uh, optimization for it to your code. Well, if, if you've already paid for an Intel compiler that optimizes your code, you might not get the same benefits right. out of ARM if you're yeah. not to that level of optimization. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say they're getting great dollar per performance out of it. So I still think of, I think it was Cloudflare, I don't know, a year and a half ago, did a shootout for like their new hardware refresh that ARM didn't quite make it. I don't remember with all the details, but. Yeah, it's, it, it really, really just depends on your yeah, workload. Yeah. Most of the time, if it's not a specialized workload, you're probably gonna get some good performance out of it. And a lot of it is just like that. It's some of it's just the licensing cost. So if you got rid of the licensing cost, which is what right. AWS has done with, with Graviton, then that is actually a major part of the performance to price ratio. Yeah. So, yeah. Pain in, in which is why some of the AMD chips too have gotten like, they're showing better performance, but it's just because their licensing fees were less right. Right. so they can cram more in there. And some of them have different cache ratios. So like if you're doing stuff that requires heavy utilization of caching, yeah. Stack would always like, they bought servers specific for workloads yeah. because they would tune L1, L2, L3 size caches yeah. um, and see you know, performance benefits that were yeah. measurable, not double digit. That was, that was optimization at that level. It was optimized. So like if you haven't optimized your thing for whatever you're running it on, you'll probably get a good report back on on arm if you can do it if you have it's not you're gonna have to redo that side of kind of work and i don't think intel targets arm at all and like there are workloads that have paid intel lots of money to get on their compiler chain because it produces the best x86 instructions and their compiler's amazing yeah and they don't give it out for free so it's like <laughs> but it's also because the instructions are so complex right so like some of the things you can do like he showed an example with adding stuff and the the arm was much much simpler there are things that if you're doing like seven operations in one instruction it would be shorter on x86 and that's usually where you've paid for either somebody to hand tune the hot path or a compiler to, to make it faster I wonder you know, if we had this conversation in five years, 10 years from now, is there going, will there be a flip? But it's it's the, taken so long for- yeah, the, the web stuff, so like when you're literally sitting waiting for bytes to come off a slower thing than you, which is exactly what you know, 
web servers do and what database servers do. Like database servers are waiting for a disk, web servers are waiting for the network. ARM can give you many more throughput sockets on you know the processor or on whatever without having to go to Go's fancy like like you could just have stupid code that runs faster on those because it could get its own core to do sure. so. And then the power too. There, there's way, way cheaper on yeah. power, and power is a sizable part of what you're paying for True. on your VCPU. So yeah. it'll be it'll and be is that just be. mostly like backwards compatibility. The, why the, Intel can't compete yeah. there, which is why what Google did with Tau was like you don't have to figure out all the edge cases because if you're a cloud native app, you're probably fine, and like you can submit some PRs and do some multi arc builds if you're trying to run. SQL Server, like maybe, but don't don't bet the farm. <laughs> on it. Any more questions for Reza? Well, thanks again, Reza. Reza.